Welcome to the Jung Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Episode 12, Individuation with Boris Matthews, Ph.D. Today's lecture will be introduced by Mary Doherty, Jungian analyst and past president of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. But before she does, I want to let you know about this year's Founders Day Symposium coming up on March 12th. Donald Kalshed, author of Trauma and the Soul, will be coming to Chicago to be the featured speaker of this symposium. For more information about the symposium, visit our website, youngchicago.org. One more thing that I want to mention is that the slides used in this presentation are available for download, so you can view them on our website. And there is a link to a PDF version of the slides in the description of this podcast. So whether you view it on iTunes or on our website, just go to the description of the podcast and you'll be able to see the link. Just click on it and you can either view them online or download them and view them wherever you want. My name is Mary Doherty and I'm an analyst at the Jung Institute of Chicago. The following podcast was a part of the new series entitled Getting to Know Jung. This initial lecture was offered in fall of 2015, which introduced key Jungian concepts to provide clinicians practical insight into the emotional lives of their clients. It is my pleasure to introduce the first presentation by Boris Matthews. Boris is an analyst in private practice, the former chair of the, uh, he's in Wisconsin, by the way, the former chair of the analyst training program, and he continues as a senior faculty member in that program. He also conducts study groups in various settings. In his lecture, Boris explores the term adaptation as it is used within the Jungian context and expands its meaning in relationship to the process of individuation as defined by Jung. Boris speaks of adaptation as articulating one's potential, of recognizing the law of one's own being, and of living with conscious, deliberate intention. He goes on to explain that there is an adaptation to outer conditions as well as an adaptation to inner conditions. Adapting to both the outer and the inner conditions of our life requires that we engage Jung's dynamic use of psychological types and attitudes. Boris then grounds these concepts in clinical practice by applying them to the amplification of his patient's dream material. I think you're going to find this tape very useful. I uh, have made an assumption. Uh, of course, assumptions are always uh, loaded with, with difficulties and dangers. And the assumption that I made is that some of you I know something about Jung, and some of you may not know much or may only know hearsay. So uh, for those who know what I'm going to talk about, uh, you can fill in the, uh, the uh, unsaid words to your table mates. And those of you who don't know anything, ask those who know something. That's a takeoff on the uh, Nasruddin story, by the way. Well, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I don't think have been talked about quite in this way. And I think they ought to be, because I think it's foundational. You've probably heard a lot of things. This is for the people who don't know maybe much about Jung. You've probably heard a lot of things about Jung. Let me see if I can get this to work. All right. You've probably heard a lot of things about Jung. Like uh, he collaborated with Freud, you know. Uh, he was a mystic. He experienced a creative illness. What else? Uh, he wrote about archetypes, about synchronicity, individuation is one of the important uh, concepts in what he has to say. But there's another aspect to Jung which is not talked about very much. And as I looked over my uh, computer files, I realized that I've been talking about this forever. And I probably will continue because I think it's foundational. And that is the concept of adaptation. Now, you don't find that expanded very much in Jung, but if you've read some of Jung's late works, You'll notice the word adaptation here and there, and you think, oh, yeah, that's very nice. 
It is very nice, but what does it mean? So that's one of the things that we're going to unpack. And I'm going to unpack that in the context of how adaptation and what goes along with that is an integral part of the process of individuation. So individuation means several things. It means uh, becoming whole, that's one of them. Wholeness, of course, means uh, some actual knowledge about oneself. It also means self-acceptance. Uh, self-acceptance, as I will quote you in a moment, is not an easy thing, but it's an important thing. As Jung says in this, this passage, self-acceptance sounds very simple, but simple things are always the most difficult. In actual life, it requires the greatest art to be simple, and so the acceptance of oneself is the essence of the moral problem and the acid test of one's whole outlook on life. Now, self-acceptance means also accepting as real where we stumble, where we fall, where we screw up. And it also means, I think, uh, accepting our history and being reminded of those times when we did the best we could, although it wasn't the best we knew. And so there's still guilt and shame and embarrassment around that. And embracing that too, not flaunting it, but saying, yeah, all right, that's, that's part of me, that has been part of me. So on to individuation. Actualizing one's potential is part of that. And as Jung says, recognizing the law of one's own being. Now this last term, recognize the law of one's own being, is a really central idea. And that means that we pay attention uh, to ourselves, and we pay attention to what, uh, very simply put, uh, draws us onward or summons us or calls us, the idea of vocation or calling. Now, calling can be a very short-term thing. It can be a long-term thing. Uh, it can be as simple as not knowing what to do after a day's work and you wander around until you notice a certain inclination of something is, is drawing your attention. But in the longer term, that sense of, if you will, life purpose, life goal, what we're about here on the planet is what it is to follow the law of one's being. And of course, that takes knowledge and courage. And growing where one is planted. That means that we live in the circumstances into which we're born or those that we can create for ourselves. Let's see where I am on these. All right, now we get to the idea of adaptation. This is something that Jung first talked about in a lecture in October of 1916. This was after he had parted company from Freud. There was a series of lectures in Zurich uh, that summer, and Jung delivered a lecture in October from which uh, some of these basic ideas are taken. You can find them in volume 18. Adaptation needs to be conscious. We need to know what we're doing. It needs to be deliberate, which means we think about it, we reflect on it, and it needs to be intentional. So all three of these terms, uh, conscious, deliberate, intentional, imply an awareness, an alertness, a waking consciousness, which rules out uh, running on autopilot, it rules out uh, passive, uh, defeatist compliance, okay? It means actually choosing as much as we possibly can, making conscious decision to do whatever it is that we end up doing. So now there are two vectors in adaptation, or two points of view, if you will. 
which are crucial. Adaptation to outer conditions, adaptation to inner conditions. The adaptation to outer conditions means the world around us, the conscious judgments we have made, the situation we're in, our waking context, however uh, long a time period that extends to. It's the day, it's the week, it's the month, it's the decade, it's the phase of life. So making a conscious, intentional, deliberate way of finding a way to live with outer conditions, which uh, are as good as we can make it at the time, or good enough. Now, that's fairly easy to grasp, but when we talk about, when Jung talks about adaptation to inner conditions, we're in a little bit of a different dimension. So let's see if I can find what he says here about that. He says, and this is from volume 18, uh, the end, uh, adaptation, individuation, collectivity is the name of the essay. He says, by inner conditions are meant those facts or data which force themselves upon my inner perception from the unconscious, independently of my conscious judgments, and sometimes even in opposition to it. Adaptation to inner conditions would thus be adaptation to the unconscious. This is really loaded, and this is really crucial. And I'm going to read it again. <laughs> and a contrast. Okay. So I've just read inner conditions. What does it say about outer conditions? Now I'll get back and reread them. My outer conditions are meant not only the conditions of the surrounding world, but also my conscious judgment, which I have formed of objective things. Objective things. Then now re reading their inner conditions, quote, by inner conditions are meant those facts or data which force themselves on my inner perception from the unconscious, from outside of my waking consciousness. Okay? independently of my conscious judgment, and sometimes even in opposition to it. Adaptation to inner conditions would thus be adaptation to the unconscious. There's an awful lot in that, but very simply stated, you know, um, inner conditions uh, can be a fantasy that persists, that, that hounds you, Inner conditions can be a repeated dream that you haven't uh, deciphered. Uh, it's news you can use, but you haven't gotten news, and so you can't use it yet. Inner conditions uh, could be a habit which uh, trips you up. Okay. Inner conditions can be a vision, it can be a numinous experience. And this is really <clears throat> where a major part, excuse me, a major part of Jungian work, as those of you who know, know, uh, takes place. It is learning how to adapt to those inner conditions that present themselves to us in these various forms. So the optimal situation is finding this relatively functional balance between extroversion and intrusion introversion between adaptation to outer conditions, which we can recognize as extroversion, and adaptation to inner conditions, which we can recognize as introversion. Now, to do this, we get into psychological type. Many of you are familiar with that from the Myers-Briggs type inventory. Um, I want you to again set aside whatever you think you know about psychological type uh, for the moment. And uh, see if you can uh, just get into these basic uh, ideas here that uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to put up here on the screen. And let's see if I can get them right. All right. So, to, to, op, uh, to operationalize these two attitudes is the question, how do we do it? 
How do we operationalize adaptation to other conditions? How do we make practical, make real, operationalize adaptation to inner conditions? Well, <clears throat> we need to perceive what's going on. We need to uh, see what the data is. We need to see what the data may imply. From the Myers-Briggs uh, type inventory, we'll recognize that they label this, or Myers and Briggs label this, as perceiving functions. Yeah, perceiving functions. Registering the data, internal data, external data. Then we also have to make choices, decisions, judgments about where the data fit and what the data mean. And you'll recognize these as the functions of judging. So in the MBTI, those of you who are familiar with it, you recall that there is, that, that it is a four letter formula and the last letter is either a P or a J. And that refers to the <coughs> perceiving functions or the judging functions. So, extroversion and introversion then. Here's what I've already said. Extroversion is the attitude by which a person relates to other conditions. Not only the conditions of the surrounding world, but also the conscious judgments which a person has made of objective things. And this, this definition is actually from that 1916 talk, which is in the collected works. Introversion is the attitude that relates one to inner conditions, meaning those facts, those data, which come to us from the unconscious, from inner perception of what's happening and brought to our attention in that way. Adaptation to the, the two inner conditions and this adaptation to uh, the unconscious. I'm going to take a brief riff here as something that's not on screen. As you know, uh, psychological type has become popular. It has uh, turned into uh, a trade for some people. It's kind of a stepchild in analytical psychology, which is most unfortunate. It's not paid adequate attention to. But very often, you will hear people say, well, I am a T, or I am an extrovert. <coughs> I am, or so-and-so is an introvert. And I protest that vehemently. Because it's not what Jung had in mind. It does not serve us well, and it misses some very important points. So here's what Jung himself said in the preface to a 1936 edition. Uh, which came out in Argentina. Here's why he got into type. If one is plunged as I am for professional reasons into the chaos of psychological opinions, prejudices, and susceptibilities, one gets a profound and indelible impression of the diversity of individual psychic dispositions, tendencies, and convictions, while on the other hand, one increasingly feels the need for some kind of order among the chaotic multiplicity of points of view. This need calls for a critical orientation and for general principles and criteria, not too specific in their formulation, which serve as points of reference in sorting out the empirical material. All right, he wanted a critical psychology. He wanted something not too specific, not too general. It would really be workable in a clinical setting. And then he says that a fundamental tendency in his work has been overlooked. And that is, well, uh, uh, let's see. The tendency was not to create a, a, uh, a type, a uh, characterology, he says. My typology 
It is far rather a critical apparatus serving to sort out and organize the welter of empirical material, but not in any sense to stick labels on people at first sight. And I could just hear him growling as he wrote that. <laughs> it is not a physiognomy. It is not an anthropological system, but a critical psychology dealing with the organization and delimitation of psychic processes that can be shown to be typical. So there are some critical words, psychic processes, which can be shown to be typical. So no human being is, is just a psychic process. All right. We have available to us extroversion and introversion, these two attitudes. We have available to us uh, the, uh, the functions that we will get to uh, here in a moment. Let's see what I've got here. All right, uh, sensation and uh, feeling and these things. As you can see here, um, the perceiving functions would be what Jung calls sensation and intuition. And the judging functions would be what Jung calls thinking and feeling. Perception of data with the physical senses. Fair enough. Intuition. Perception of data without benefit of physical senses. That's my phrase. Jung says via the unconscious, which doesn't really help us very much. OK. Uh, perception of data without benefit of physical senses. We don't need our eyes. We don't need our ears. It's uh, in the mind's eye, it's in the mind's ear that we, we perceive these things. Thinking is a way of judging where data fit in a recognized or into known patterns, or judging, thinking is also the process of creating those patterns. And I'll give an example. And then we get to the difficult one, feeling. Feeling, in, in its narrow sense, and its precise sense as Jung uses it, and as it ought to be used in analytical psychology, is evaluating data in terms of human value. Now, why is it so difficult to get clear what the feeling function is? So I'm going to go through several negative definitions. And I will preface that by examples of how the word feeling is used. I feel anxious this morning. That's an emotion. Uh, I feel tired. That's perception of a, of a physical state. Well, I feel that this is a very human day. That's a judgment. That's, a, 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 again, a perception. I feel I ought to x, y, and z. Okay. You know, is that think, or is that the pressure of a superego acting on me? Um, we use the word feeling to cover a lot of bases uh, that really uh, confuse things. And the problem with that is that we're not really clear about what the feeling function is supposed to do, and therefore, uh, we contaminate the word with lots of other usages. When you get down to making judgments in terms of human values, you see, that clarifies things a whole lot. So my feeling function says that it is not suitable uh, for me to have my cell phone ringing at a funeral. That's a judgment. It's not suitable, it's not fitting, all right? It's not suitable to me personally uh, to uh, put up with a lot of extended loud noise. That's a judgment. It's not good for me. So I hope you're getting some sense now of the values that affect a larger group of people. The cell phone at the funeral? No. But you just don't do that to people. And you're not ringing your cell phones in here, so you've got good extroverted feeling this morning to thank you for that. And I shut mine down too, so it's, it's not going to ring on you. 
So feeling, evaluating data in human terms is what we've got to be about here. All right, what do we do with this? Let's see if the next slide is the right one. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Conscious psyche is an apparatus for adaptation and orientation. So that means that if we have access to uh, a function that uh, relates us to the world and have access to an attitude or function that helps us deal with uh, inner perception, we've got a couple of very good, we've got the necessary equipment to adapt to what is coming up in us, to what is happening inside, and we have the tools to adapt to what's happening around us and to orient ourselves inwardly and to orient ourselves in, in the world. All right. Now, putting it all together, how do attitude and functions serve adaptation and further individuation? This is where it really comes together. Uh, and this is a piece that, that um, I, I hope works for you as we put it out here. So, adaptation and individuation, they're clinically important concepts, it's enduring value. As I said, individuation means wholeness, means becoming whole, not the same as becoming perfect. We all know that. Individuation means, and wholeness means, gaining factual knowledge about oneself, about our strengths, our weaknesses, our traits, our parts, and those things we're ashamed of as well as those things we're proud of. And as I said earlier, self-acceptance. And again, this is a review. Adaptation has these two vectors. Adaptation to inner conditions, adaptation to outer conditions, introversion and extroversion they've come to be known. And we need to be able to adapt to both of those worlds, the so-called inner world, whatever that means, and, and the outer world. Just sort of as a, a sidebar here, uh, there's some question, you know, uh, where does the unconscious uh, end? What are the limits of the unconscious? Well, that came up just this morning in a talk I had with somebody. Um, is the unconscious limited by my skin? Maybe, but I don't think so. The unconscious, you know, is really a negative statement. It's all of which I am not aware. So, who knows what the end is? So we need to be able to adapt to both the inner world, whose limits we cannot determine, and the outer world, that seems pretty, uh, pretty definite and finite. And so that we have then these four functions, these tools. We've got perceiving, we've got judging. <clears throat> I want to give then briefly a, uh, a dream example that perhaps will illustrate uh, how this might work. I have permission to use the dream, which is always always a good thing to have. It's a seemingly simple dream. The dreamer relates that he is observing a scene. The setting is the high desert of the West. He sees himself in one of the train cars on a 19th century train chugging through the high desert. It's daytime. In the dream, he knows that there are bandits running along the top of the train cars, as was wont to be the case in the Western movies we saw as kids. And in the dream, the dreamer in the car says, if I can lock the doors and close the windows, I will be safe from those bandits. So he secures the windows and he locks the doors and he's very satisfied with himself. 
that the bandits now are excluded. But then, suddenly, uh, a bandit has been perched up somewhere and lands on the dreamer's shoulders and he awakes terrified. So he brings us to analysis. Now, those of you who know how to work with dreams, you know, you, you can take a couple of minutes snooze here while I tell those who don't know how you mean to work with dreams and how we go about it. We need to know who the dreamer is. And we need to know who the dreamer is because of a very fundamental uh, relationship between the unconscious and consciousness. And that relationship is called compensation. Consciousness does not have the full story, whatever the story is. The unconscious, according to you, will supply missing information that is important for the dreamer to be aware of. So in this dream, the dreamer doesn't know whatever news this dream is bringing. All right. What about the dreamer? We need to know not only about compensation, we need to know something about the dreamer himself. Well, this is a guy in his 30s, an academic type, pretty heady, pretty timid, pretty scared uh, to be assertive. So there we have just a thumbnail that, that's adequate for, for understanding the dream. So what we see here is a defensive move in the dream. Locking the windows, locking the doors, and feeling that he has excluded the bandits. All right. So you ask the dreamer, well, for you, what is a bandit? And the answer is, the person's, uh, the dreamer's a particular sense, say, well, they're, they're outlaws, you know. They just do whatever they want. They take whatever they want. They don't give a damn about anybody. Hmm, okay. So now we have what the dream is saying, what the dream is showing the dream. So what it seems to be saying is that you're trying to exclude what looks to you like a bandit. But you know, if you strip away that rather exaggerated portrait, it's really an image of going after what you want. Mr. Timon, going after what you want. But it's shown in the dream as a bandit because that is how the dreamer feels about self-assertion. All right. It was a useful dream. He got another one later on that, that amplified that also. So now, what does he need to do in terms of, of uh, what we've talked about in uh, adaptation? Well, he's gotten some data, all right, from the inner sense. And that's the dream. Here, the dream provides us data. Talks about um, a defensive uh, attitude, and it talks about fear a, t a terrible fear, actually, of self-assertion and how it is so uh, prohibitive. We can talk about that now as therapists. Hmm, okay, we can relate that fear of self-assertion to the defensive structure. Those are obviously T operations that we're doing here. Um, we didn't do much with the possibilities that this dream might carry. But as therapists, you know, we can say, well, for us, as practitioners, looks like we need to uh, find some way to work on this guy's fear of self-assertion, sense of safety with self-assertion. There would be, if you will, uh, an intuition, an inf drawing an inference. We also see from the dream, the dreamer's evaluation of the bandits in human terms, or in personal terms. That would be his feeling function. If he was introverted feeling, good, 
terrible. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the question comes, how do we talk about this dream as facilitating this man's individuation, becoming whole? Well, he's, he knows his adaptation of the world, or as therapists, we would know his adaptation of the world. We know something about his adaptation to the inner world, those impulses, those uh, drives, okay? He's got to find a way, and we have to help him find a way to balance, if you will, uh, first probably clean up through experimentation, clean up his, his fear of self-assertion, and find a way that he can, little by little, assert himself in the world, use that inner impulse, that, that basic human um, drive, if you will, in the context in which he lives. And that is a step toward his becoming closer to wholeness. It's a step toward his individuation. <laughs> So, it may sound terribly simple, and it is in some ways. I think this is something that is not said very often, though, in Jungian circles. It's clarifying a very fundamental uh, group of related, it's clarifying the relationship between a group of fundamentally related uh, phenomena, namely psychological type, and individuation. The relationship between inner and outer. It clarifies Jung's intentions with uh, what he meant the psychological type. So we don't say that this guy is, is X, Y, uh, and Z, and whatever, W, X, Y, Z, we need four letters for MBTI. We say that his his feeling function, his, his judging function, both personally and in regard to world, is you know, a little bit skewed here. He's not as bad a guy as he thinks he is, and the world isn't really as dangerous as a place as it seems to him. Okay. Um, so, Finishing up here and leave time for, we've got about, I'll give you a few minutes here for questions and comments. Let's see what my next slide is. Okay, we did that. All right, then in Jung's essay, Development of Personality, he has this really wonderful passage. And he characterizes the goal. He says, the goal, or he wrote, the goal is uh, approached uh, uh, through the optimum development of the whole individual human being, which calls for the absolute affirmation of all that constitutes the individual, the most successful adaptation to universal conditions of existence, coupled with the greatest possible freedom for self-determination. And of course, this is a trade-off. You know, you've got to make these choices. You've got to balance what moves in you, I've got to balance what moves in me against my judgment of how it's going to fly in the world around me. So we need knowledge. We need to be able to observe ourselves. We need to be able to observe the world around us. I think as clinicians, we do this all the time with our clients without perhaps having this level of clarity, if you will, of the moves, uh, of the transactions, of the interventions that we are uh, performing. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes. I would be glad to uh, hear your questions, your comments, your responses. So, go for it. Remarks? Yes? Can you just repeat the piece that you said about um, this is something that you don't hear very much in any circles and it was about the relationship Something is clarifying the relationship between those. Yes. You can ask other analysts here in the, in the audience today, but my sense of it is that 
I don't remember seeing a close connection in anything that's I've read between uh, psychological type as Jung talks about it and the process of individuation. Okay. In other words, uh, this adding in the psychological type piece, the adaptation part, uh, operationalizes the process. It makes clearer what we've got to do if we really are serious about becoming whole. Okay, what have I got to do to become whole? Well, here are the steps, you know. I've got to know myself. I've got to get the data about myself. I have to understand where that information, that data fits. That would be the thinking function, okay. Certain abilities, certain inclinations. Well, where can I use these particular inclinations, these particular interests in the world? All right. What are the possibilities? That would be the intuitive part. Fine, I have these, uh, these traits or these, these interests. What can I do with them? And then the fourth part is evaluating. How satisfying will that be? How well will that work in the world? Now, so far so good? I think this, you're saying those four elements, it's as if those provide a certain, almost like a, not to oversimplify, but almost like a step-by-step. Just about. Yeah. Just about. So a, an example just came to me that maybe will be helpful. See if I can get it specific enough. Well, somebody recognizes that, that uh, he or she has uh, a great interest in, give me an example, a great interest in something, but looking around the world cannot perceive where it would fit. You know, what can I do with this? How can I, I, how can I earn a living? This is what I'm really passionate about. But can I earn a living with it? There we're using psychological type. It's self-perception, but it's also looking out to adapting to the world, fitting, finding a place. Where can I make the most of this talent in the world, get paid for it, and live indoors, you know, and have groceries in my fridge? I think some of you have been there. Okay. Is that Helpful enough? Did that clarify things okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the gentleman. In your own clinical experience, what would be the biggest challenges or barriers for a person to uh, get to a point of individuation? The biggest challenge? Yes. Or challenges? What I'm going to say is, again, borrowed from Jung, and I can't tell you where he says it, but, but he does. The biggest challenge is to become a problem to oneself. That is absolutely the biggest problem. When a person says, I can't stand myself, I can't stand the way I am. Okay, then we got something to work with. So after that then, I think uh, the next big challenge probably is to be able to start seeing where one trips oneself up, okay? And often that will come up early as a big dream, showing the goal, and then subsequent dreams tend to uh, be closer to a current lived life. Just a very brief dream example. And this one was published by uh, Max Zeller in a series called uh, dreams of a successful man. And there's, as I recall the dream, it's in a series, and there's something in a Mexican shop that this man wants. And he rides up to it, but he's on horse. And the door is, is very low, you know? And he realizes in the dream, if I'm going to get into the shop, I have to get off my high horse. <laughs> okay. This is the kind of thing that does come up. I saw a lady's hand over here and then you, sir. Yeah. What is the impact of the collective unconscious on the individual? What is the impact of the collective unconscious? Plenty. <laughs> All right. 
the example I'm going to give are uh, one of Jung's dreams before the outbreak of the First World War. Okay, and he's, you know those? Okay, you can see them in memories, dreams, and reflections, I think. But Jung is riding in a train, I believe he has these dreams three times, or versions of them. But he's riding the train, he dozes off, and he has this dream or vision of a, a flood. A Europe is being flooded, and the flood is a flood of blood. And everything is being wiped out, and buildings, and people, and, and uh, roads, and churches, and everything. And the flood rises higher and higher and higher. And this was early August, late July of 1914. And he wondered if he was going crazy. Now that's you know that's another another talk about what is crazy and what is not crazy. But anyway, when World War One finally broke out, he realized, oh my God, that is not a personal dream. That is a dream about what's happening on the planet. So people do get these kinds of big dreams. But I think probably more often people get big dreams which are more personal that uh, say something like the train or the door or another one where a man dreams uh, that he sees a little girl lying in a, an emaciated little girl figure lying in a dusty road and clenched in one of her hands is uh, a, a lump of gold. It's clenched so tightly that it has the imprint of her fingers. And then rabble kids uh, on the, show up suddenly and save the gold at lunch uh, for the figure lying in the road. Now, just very, very uh, briefly, so that we can have our break, the figure of the little girl here, you know, we can't take this literally. We have to take this as, as, as more than literal. So just cut quickly to the chase. Uh, the little girl represents that function of relationship to the unconscious, or that would be that inner uh, directed vector in, in, uh, in adaptation. That would be in perversion in that sense of perceiving and relating to what's happening. So that the emaciated little girl is a visual equivalent to an introversion, if you will, to the introverted attitude. And it's saying, you know, there's gold in you. There's gold. But your relation to it is emaciated. And it's threatened by whatever these rebel kids represent. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst for you, 